of people on the call, which is wonderful. And um, thanks to, um, to Neil for being here this evening. So thanks very much. Just as a brief introduction, I'm Emma Chapman. I'm the new executive director for Pathways. Um, Pathways is a serious mental illness society. Um, I just want to tell you a bit more about us. We offering a lot of initiatives at the moment. Um, first, we have our family to family course that's coming up next week. It's starting um, and we're having this in four locations. They're actually, it's an eight week course this time, but offered online. Um, and we're offering it in different um, communities around BC. It is, um, it's meant that we, by being online, Obviously, because of the current climate, it's meant that we've actually been able to reach lots of individuals that are out in remote communities. Um, so if you are interested in joining, it's, um, we have a few places left and Valeska is going to share the link with us now in this chat. Um, and you can go ahead and register if you're interested. Um, just to give you an overview of our family to family course, it's an education course delivered peer to peer. And the purpose is to empower families with information, helping those um, who take the course to feel that they have more skills and knowledge um, of serious mental illness and give them uh, revised strength and, and confidence in supporting their family members with mental illness. Um, Pathways also supports um, and provides uh, weekly support group sessions. We currently are offering these online as well through um, Zoom video calls. So family members um, with um, mental illnesses and relatives with mental illnesses who are suffering from um, serious mental illness such as schizophrenia, bipolar, depression um, or anxiety disorders are, are more than welcome to join. These um, these sessions we find that um, lots of the family members coming together um, often share similar um, issues and so they can really relate so they're really support information sharing sessions and Valeska is going to to um, share the link as well for, for more information on, on those. Um, and if you'd like to hear more about some of our upcoming lectures, um, our support groups, education and events, please do subscribe to our newsletter. Um, Valeska is going to, again, include that in the chat. Um, Pathways which would really not be able to do any of these events um, without your interest, participation and support. So if you, um, if you have found you know, find today's session of interest and have really um, benefited from our services in the past, please do consider making a donation to Pathways. Um, we also have memberships, so it's $25 for our membership, so our yearly membership, so please do consider um, those options. So um, I would like to thank and welcome Corporal Neil Jones, um, who would like to thank for, for generously donating his time today and um, coming along this evening and speaking with us all. Corporal Neil Jones is in charge of the police um, mental Health Intervention Unit in North Vancouver, RCMP. Um, the format of this session, we're going to have Neil present um, and we will ask that you all remain muted during his presentation. At the end, we are going to host a Q&A and um, this session will actually, um, the, Neil's presentation is going to be recorded this evening so we can share um, the information that he is sharing. Um, but the Q&A session that we're going to have at the end will not be recorded just so you're all aware. So we are going to ask that you all remain on mute to limit background noise and to allow Neil to present and for us to record that session. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to stop recording towards the end um, for the Q&A. And so throughout the presentation, if you have questions that you would like to ask, please do pop them in the, the chat function that is, is on Zoom and Valeska and I will work through those questions and present them to Neil at the end um, and so hopefully we, we can collate all, those, all that information and Neil will have time to answer those at the end for you. Brilliant, well I think that's all from me so I'll pass it over to Neil. Are you sure you don't want to go on any further because I'm very very nervous? <laughs> you know, I'm good thanks, my dog's not it's just a brave, it's a brave, brave new world, isn't it? Um, you're all, uh, I've invited you all into my home. This is my home. I live in Lynn Valley. Um, and you have all invited me into your homes. I'm assuming most of you will be uh, sitting at home. So it's a brave new world. Um, I was saying to Valeska and Emma earlier on that I, I much prefer doing this in, uh, in, a, in a big open um, auditorium or uh, that sort of thing. I love working a crowd. I love walking up and down the aisles and talking to people and sharing stories with people more intimately than, uh, than this, the, the world that we're in right now. But um, uh, there, there's a part of me that says, uh, 
uh, this is a really good thing because it allows it allows people who uh, who may not be able to get out of the house this this evening to to come to an auditorium or something if it wasn't COVID uh, and come and see uh, me. And uh, I think really um, my message is uh, is one of inclusivity for everyone. I want everyone to feel as though you're part of uh, of uh, um, supporting your loved one uh, or, or your peers, whoever it is that you're here to, to learn things about and learn how to better support people in the community um, when you call 911 and when you interact with the police. Because I know that um, for a lot of us, uh, it can be quite a scary thing to have to call the police because it usually means that we're having one of the worst days of our lives. Um, so I hope that you get something out of this. Um, as I say, I, I like work in a room. It's going to be difficult with Zoom, so I won't be able to do that. So I hope it doesn't come across as too dry. Um, I try not to read the slides verbatim, and I try to expand on it and give stories. Uh, so without further ado, let me just see if this works. Uh, Emma, this is for you to see if it works. We got to make sure this thing works. Oh, it's not working. Oh, hang on. There we go. Yeah, we can see that. Okay, so here we go. This is my presentation. Um, obviously, you know who I am now, so we'll skip over to the next screen. Um, I was asked to put in something funny, so uh, that's me there riding the horse. Uh, we don't do that anymore in the in the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. We have we have a very specific section, the the Mounted Police uh, section, uh, the musical ride that they they ride horses uh, as a full time job, and that's that's really cool. They go all over the world for that. Uh, so again, uh, my name is. Corporal Neil Jones, uh, and I'm in charge of the uh, mental health intervention unit here in North Vancouver. And this little, uh, this little meme, I love these little memes. Uh, what my friends think I do, I was standing around eating coffee and donuts. Yes, that does happen. I am a subject matter expert. If you wanna know where the best donuts are, you can ask later on, well, I'll get those uh, answers to you. Uh, what my mom thinks I do, yes, just writing tickets all the time. Uh, what society thinks I do, yeah, there's some of that. I think some people think that. Uh, what my boss thinks I do. Yeah, I think sometimes my boss wonders what, what actually happens. Uh, and then of course, RoboCop, that's me. I'm all RoboCop, especially in my early days in Surrey. That was totally RoboCop. And then really actually what I do do, and not just me as the, uh, the person who's in charge of the mental health unit, but, but uh, most police officers spend way too much time on their computers doing paperwork. Um, I like to say that uh, if, if you go to a file that takes about 30 minutes to deal with, um, uh, you'll spend the next hour typing that file up. It's almost twice. Uh, so if you spend four hours dealing with a file, you'll spend eight hours writing the file up. Uh, and that is the reality of, of the world we live in. It's document, 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 document. So here's some background about me so you know who I am. Like, who is this guy that's talking? Um, I joined when I was 37 years old. It was my third career. Um, I was in corporate sales in the technology sector before, uh, and I have a gas fitting ticket. Um, I haven't kept up the gas fitting ticket, but I still, you know, run a gas line at my own house for a fire pit in the backyard or a, or, or a barbecue. Uh, I've been married for, I should change that slide because just the other, like just on the 28th, we, uh, we hit 24 years. So I've been married for 24 years. I have two boys, 12 and nine. Um, as I said, I live in beautiful Lynn Valley. I absolutely love Lynn Valley and I feel so blessed to be here. Uh, we moved back to North Vancouver uh, about five years ago. We moved to Maple Ridge um, because the commute from North Van to Surrey uh, was terrible back uh, when I first joined. I was living in North Vancouver in Central Lonsdale. I had a house there and I got posted in Surrey. And on, you know, five o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning, it would take me about 40 minutes to get to work. And three o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday, it would take me three and a half hours to get to work. Uh, so it was terrible. So I moved to Maple Ridge and we've, uh, we feel very lucky to have been able to move back to, Maple, to uh, North Vancouver five years ago, because it's ultimately where I want to leave, where I want to raise my kids. Uh, I dabble in woodworking and home renovations. Some of the work is right there. I, I built all this. This is my closet. Um, put all that in. Uh, actually built it from uh, just lumber from the lumber store. Um, and I love to mountain bike and ski with my kids. Um, yeah, so that's a bit about who I am. Uh, I've been uh, I've been on the job for 12 and a half years. It'll be well, it's, I, sh I should say it's almost 13 years. November will be 13 years for me. I did my first seven and a half years in Surrey, and and what a what a great opportunity for someone who is high energy like me and likes to work a crowd. Like I said, um, 
I don't like to sit for too long. I, I like to get out there and, and meet people and get out there. And um, I really enjoyed chasing bad guys. And there was a target rich environment in, uh, in Surrey. Uh, so I had a ton of fun. I learned a lot. Um, but I was able to get transferred uh, to North Vancouver. Eventually I was able to make that work. So it took me seven and a half years to make that work, but well, that was fine. I, I was committed to Surrey for five years and I gave them an extra two and a half years after that. Uh, before I was able to make the transfer to North Vancouver. Um, all of my service uh, up until uh, February of 2019, all of my service has been in frontline policing. Um, so wearing the uniform, being in the front lines, uh, answering calls for service, if you call because, you know, uh, uh, your, uh, your house was broken into or your car was stolen or you lost your wallet or your dog is, your, your neighbor's dog was barking or whatever, um, that's what frontline policing policing is. Uh, general duty members is what we used to call it. We now call it frontline policing. Um, I became an advocate for members' uh, well-being. That's kind of where, where my slant started going. Uh, you know, some police officers, when they join, they have a focus on traffic, or they have a focus on drug investigations, or they have a focus on um, uh, economic crime. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't really have a focus. I was a generalist. I liked uh, getting my hands dirty in multiple different things and, and trying different things. But uh, I really started becoming uh, aware of uh, mental health and how it affected police officers uh, when I was in Surrey. And I, I had a really good friend of mine, co-worker of mine, who went off with an operational stress injury. Um, and we worked diligently to try to get him back on the road. Uh, and he could never get back to the road. And so he eventually took a medical discharge from the RCMP. Uh, and that's when it kind of got me thinking, wow, what is going on here? This guy was one of the hardest workers I'd ever known. He was, he loved chasing bad guys. All he wanted, ever wanted to do was be a police officer his entire life. He had the highest number of arrests, highest number of uh, traffic tickets, highest number of reports to Crown Council. Uh, he was everywhere all the time. Um, and uh, it kind of got me thinking that if, if it could happen to him, it, it could happen to me, it could happen to other members. So my, my direction started uh, kind of going towards a mental health slant, but for more internal stuff. Uh, I became an instructor for R2MR. R2MR is uh, an acronym for Road to Mental Readiness. Uh, and the Road to Mental Readiness is a course that we taught, that we became mandatory, that we taught all of our frontline police officers, well, all the police officers in, in, uh, in the RCMP have been trained in R2MR. And it's about taking care of yourself and about taking care of your partners and looking out for those signs and symptoms that the, the member may be slipping or maybe off of their baseline. Uh, we now, now that I know more about what I, uh, about the mental health side, I would say they would be decompensating uh, in the community if they were slipping off of their baseline for any length of time. Um, so I became an instructor for that. Um, and then uh, I taught um, myself and a co-presenter uh, presented to the entire North Vancouver detachment and I presented uh, locally throughout uh, other detachments in the lower mainland. Um, so I guess I started kind of making a name for myself that I kind of maybe knew something about mental health. I really didn't. All I did was take a course and how to teach a course. I wasn't an expert in this. I don't have a background in it. Um, but um, that started kind of the start of the ball rolling, I think. Um, I joined the crime reduction team, which is a proactive team here in North Vancouver, where we, I like to say, well, I, I, I summarize it for my 12 year olds and, and nine year old boys. I, I summarize it by saying we hunt bad guys. Um, so we would hunt bad guys. We would go after them. We would, and then we would do surveillance on targets and that sort of thing. That was the crime reduction team. And then uh, uh, I was in there for about a year and then I, I got promoted. And I went back to frontline policing where I started really developing my skills uh, as a supervisor and a leader of our frontline workers and making sure that we were taking care of them. Um, and then I think somebody kind of caught on to the fact that I had a, a brain for some mental health stuff and, and could, you know, help out a little bit. So they kind of tapped me on the shoulder uh, and, and approached me to ask me if I would head up the mental health team. And I thought, wow, that's, what a great honor. I can't, wow, what a great honor. And I thought, well, hold on a second. Maybe I was messing up so bad as a corporal on frontline policing that they had to get me off of there and they just, they hid me over here. But I, I don't think that's really what happened. So now I'm in the mental health team. 
Um, so the mental health uh, intervention unit is made up of myself. One, I'm a corporal and I have two constables, Constable Barbary and Constable McIntyre. Constable McIntyre, unfortunately, is, uh, fortunately for her, but unfortunately for me, because I'm selfish, um, is on maternity leave right now. So I can't get her back until I think we're about 10 months away. I'm counting it down. Um, so those are my, uh, those are my, my partners on my team. And I, and I honestly, I honestly call them my partners. They don't work for me. We work together. Um, Constable Barbary is a great sounding board. Um, she is, uh, she's wonderful. Constable Barbary is, is a huge, huge advocate for vulnerable people in the community. And, and she becomes quite fierce. She becomes quite fierce to, to support them in the community. Um, so what does our unit do? Uh, well, frontline members, uh, as I said before, frontline members uh, take calls for service. And so if you call because uh, your loved one was in crisis or, um, or uh, uh, you thought that your neighbor was in crisis or someone that you're supporting was in crisis, you would call the you would call 911 frontline members would go um, and then they would make a determination on how what the outcome of that call was going to be hopefully with your input and and, and that sort of thing uh, and then if they don't apprehend the person and we'll get into that a little bit later on if they don't apprehend the person they'll send us an email and they'll send a it's kind of a referral they'll send an email saying hey just so you know uh I had to go and, and visit Valeska in the community uh, the other day, and she appeared to be slightly decompensating the community. Um, you may want to reach out to her. Uh, I see her laughing there. That's good. Um, and then what we'll do is uh, we will contact our healthcare partners, so people from the Hope Center, and we'll have a conversation with them, and we'll find out whether or not Valeska is connected with services in the community or ever has been. Uh, Quite often, we, we find out that the, the person has been or is connected with services. And then we, we share information as to what happened, why the police were called, so that the caseworker and the psychiatrist can get a better fulsome picture of what's happening in the community um, that they may not know about. Because they may have to just rely on what the patient tells them when they come in, and the patient may say everything's been fine, but in reality, they've had two or three contacts with the police or the healthcare system in another way. And that may not be a good thing. That may be a sign showing that they are in, in need of support. So it's, it's an interesting dichotomy that, you know, the, the police don't generally like to share information. We have to be concerned with privacy right, privacy act. So does the healthcare system. They're very, very concerned around privacy, but collectively what we do is we share the information uh, as part of the whole circle of care, that we are part of that circle of care. Because if, if, if we remove, the, the police part of it, then the healthcare system won't have the fulsome picture of what's actually happening in the community and vice versa. The police won't know what has worked with this person in the past or the fact that this person may need to get connected with services again um, because, uh, because they have worked in the past. Um, so we'll talk to our partners we'll in, when, and then we'll establish a plan to engage that person, try to get them connected to services. Uh, and then try to manage the, 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 any future crisis. We don't, obviously we don't want people going into crisis where the police have to get called. As I said before, anytime the police have to get called, generally speaking, it's because somebody's having a really bad day. Um, I keep waiting and praying for the day that somebody calls up and says, oh, hello, Corporal Jones. Yeah, I just won the lottery. I need you to come and drive me to the lottery center to pick up my big giant check. Because that would be a, probably one of the only few times that uh, somebody is very happy to see a police officer. Although there is a story, I like telling stories. I had a story once where I was, uh, I was fairly new into North Vancouver and I was driving along and I saw a guy roll through a red light and I thought, oh good, that's an easy ticket. So I go after him and I pull up alongside him. It's like two o'clock in the morning and I'm getting out of the car and he's yelling out the window saying, my wife is having a baby. I'm like, okay, follow me. And I went lights and sirens and took him to the hospital. So that was probably a good, that was probably a good time that we had contact with somebody. Uh, our unit really strives to minimize the stigma and, and the trauma of, uh, of people in the community when they have to deal with the police. Um, we're not always successful. Uh, you know, sometimes there's, it's, it just doesn't work. Sometimes uh, the, the, the police officers go in, they don't, maybe they don't have the right information, maybe they don't have the fulsome picture of what's happening. Um, and, and, or sometimes the person they're dealing with is violent and it's going to be a traumatic experience. It's going to be traumatic for the patients, it's going to be traumatic for the, the police officers, it's going to be traumatic for uh, anyone else that sees it. But our unit 
uh, we strive to try to minimize uh, that impact. And we try and do that by getting people connected to services before they get into crisis. And then when they are connected, we try to keep them connected. And I'll give you an example. We have a woman who lives in our community and um, she is on injection medication in order to manage her psychosis. And if she doesn't get this medication, she will go into psychosis and she will get into crisis. And then she starts doing things which puts herself at risk and other people at risk as well. And so every month I, I, I go with a nurse, we go with, uh, with her meds and we drive to her house and we go and have a visit and we uh, have a discussion with her and she takes her meds and we make sure that she's connected and that she's, feel, that she's uh, um, stabilized in the community. Um, yeah, which kind of goes on to the next point of us assisting healthcare pro uh, providers, partners, tracking down patients and that sort of thing. Um, we also have some times where they call us and they say, you know, uh, so-and-so is on extended leave and they've missed two appointments and they didn't show up for their, uh, for their meds. So we have now a form 21 and a form 21 is a, a recall form signed by the doctor, the psychiatrist who is the primary care uh, provider for that person, they'll sign a form 21 and they basically, it compels us as police officers to go and find the person and bring them back to the facility. Uh, yeah, so that's what we do. So why us? I mean, isn't this a healthcare issue? Um, and it is, it, this is a healthcare issue. Um, you know, back in my day when I was a young kid, I'm probably going to date myself here, but when I was a young kid, I, get, I always remember my mom saying, oh, you better stop talking to yourself because the men in the white suits and the white van are going to come and take you away in a straitjacket. Um, those days are long gone. Um, we don't have that anymore. Um, and until we have something that slots in between the ambulance and the police, uh, Any time that you call for an ambulance because you have a loved one or someone that you're supporting in the community that is in crisis, uh, generally what happens is the ambulance will say, okay, thank you, we'll get someone there. Then they hang up and then they call us and they say, we need you to go and make it safe for our members. So the ambulance attendants won't even attend sometimes um, unless the, the police are there and the police say, it's all good. Um, the, the problem with that uh, is that as soon as we are engaged as police officers, we cannot disengage. So we can't go. Um, so you guys call the ambulance, the ambulance then calls us, we go and we think, okay, this person needs to be apprehended and they need to go to the hospital involuntarily. Uh, we can't then just hand them off to the ambulance and, and hope, fingers crossed, that the ambulance takes them to the hospital and there's no issues. Uh, we have to stay engaged. Uh, in accordance to the Mental Health Act, we as police officers, if we decide that somebody must be apprehended, they must have their right to freedom of movement taken away from them under the Mental Health Act, uh, we have to uh, engage immediately and we need to get them to a, uh, a designated facility as quickly as possible and then wait with them until we can present them to a doctor. So if I was to apprehend somebody in the community, uh, I have to stay with them, I have to transport them myself, or I would ride in the ambulance with them if there was a health, um, a medical health care issue as well as the mental health stuff. Um, but I would ride with them. Um, at the very least, I would follow them in my police car, but most of the time we would ride with them and then wait with them at the hospital until they're seen by a doctor. So I know a lot of people say, well, why is it that I called for an ambulance? I didn't call for the police. Why the hell are the police here? That's why. Um, and, you know, it, it is the way it is. I, the, the police officers cannot walk away. Um, uh, we have liability issues. Um, uh, we have the independent investigations office. So if we were to walk away from a situation um, and then something awful was to happen to this person, um, the in independent investigations officers would say, well, you had contact with them an hour before, um, they, they hurt themselves or, or, uh, or die by suicide, heaven forbid. You had it, you were there for an hour, you were there an hour before we could be held liable. Uh, and we would have an inquest and there would be an investigation. We would be, um, and then quite possibly charges would be forwarded against us. 
Um, so because of liability, because of independent oper uh, investigations office, because of pu public expectations, we cannot disengage. Uh, the police have authorities and expectations on the Mental Health Act. I've kind of spoken about some of those, uh, but we also, so I like to say that, that my job, I'm not a rocket scientist, I'm not that smart. Um, and so this job is a really good job for me. Uh, I, I manage myself under the, the Mental Health Act, the Criminal Code of Canada, Common Law, the Police Act, and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Really, everything else there uh, is second to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, we have to ask some pretty tough questions before we take someone's right to freedom of movement away or take their right away from them for making their own decisions. Um, we will do that under the Criminal Code of Canada. That's what an arrest is. An arrest is we are taking their right to freedom of movement away. But also, let's be clear, if, uh, if just because you committed a crime does not give me, does not allow me to arrest someone. So I'll say that again. Just because you've committed a crime does not give me the uh, carte blanche to arrest. I have to ask a bunch of questions in my own mind of why I must arrest. Uh, if you've committed a crime, I can forward charges against you and just compel you to court with a document, an appearance notice, without actually arresting you. It's the arresting that we have a problem with. We have a, we have a big concern with arrests, taking someone's right to freedom of movement away. So anytime a police officer makes that decision to arrest, they've asked a bunch of questions. One of them is, what is, is it in the public interest? Well, obviously, if this person just did some heinous crime of it against another human being, we aren't going to release them. We're going to arrest them and hold them. Uh, repetition, if repetition is an issue. So if I said to the person, well, what are you gonna do if you walk away from here? And they say, well, I'm gonna go and steal from the store next door as well. Well, the repetition's an issue, I will arrest you. Um, identity, so if we, don't know who, if we don't know who the person is, identity, if identity is an issue, we can arrest for, to confirm who they are through fingerprinting and then sending it off to Ottawa. Uh, court. If they have shown in the past that they will not attend court, if I try to compel them with documents to, to, uh, to come to court, um, if court is an issue, I can arrest them. Uh, and evidence, if I believe that the person that just stole the chocolate bar also stole um, a, a, a Coca-Cola uh, and a bag of chips and it's on their person, I can arrest them in order to get that evidence. So it's, it's, a, it's a search of the person incidental to arrest. So that's what we have to do for a criminal code conviction. So can you imagine the things that we have to ask ourselves before we take someone's right to freedom of movement away under the Mental Health Act? Um, it's not always clear that, that uh, to us that the person should have their right to freedom of movement away and shouldn't. You know, it's difficult as a police officer, you're standing there and you don't know whether or not you're gonna apprehend somebody under the Mental Health Act or not. But that is a decision that has to be made by the individual police officer who is there. Um, and every individual police officer will have, will have to look at the totality of that situation in order to make that determination. Because they're the ones that are going to have to own that decision, uh, no matter what the outcome was. So police considerations, what do we look for as frontline policing? Okay, so this is frontline police officers. Um, we have access to a database, obviously, we have access to a database. So when you call, um, and let's say you're calling and, and you're talking to our call taker, uh, she is going to ask you a bunch of questions about this person that you're calling about. They're going to ask for their, their first and last name, their date of birth. They're going to ask you if there's been any history. They're going to ask you um, whether or not there's any weapons in the house, whether or not drugs or alcohol is a factor, how many other people are in the residence, um, if there's language barriers, are there dogs in the house and all those other things. And now with COVID, they'll ask you a bunch of health, health screening questions as well. Uh, so these are the police considerations. We want to know the history. Uh, the experience of the attending police officer is a factor. So you may have somebody that's fresh out of uh, training. Um, they may be eight months and they're on their own. They may have a different viewpoint of how they're going to handle the situation than what I will that's had almost 13 years of experience, mostly frontline policing with uh, a mental health slant. Size of the patient relative to the attending police officer. So again, if they're going for somebody that is in crisis and the call is, I need you to come because my, my 20 year old son is downstairs throwing things around his room. And by the way, he's six foot four and 230 pounds. That is, that is information we're gonna to wanna to know. Um, because that will dictate how we attend. It doesn't mean that we're gonna come with more force, 
or with, uh, with a, a preparation for a fight, no, but we will not, I'm five foot two and 120 pounds, I'm about as small as they come, I would not come into the house alone in a situation like that. I would bring a couple of people. And uh, I always like to say that, that, that sometimes less is more or sometimes more is less. Um, if we bring more police officers, there is less likely a chance that somebody will become injured during that uh, arrest if it gets to that level. Um, and what we don't have um, as police officers is we don't have the ability to look into the future and know what the outcome is gonna be of us walking through a door. Uh, we also look at situational factors, uh, obviously including the environment, how cold it is, how warm it is, whether or not the person is outside, how slippery the steps are, um, how many people are in the house, if there's alcohol involved, um, and, and all of those factors I've talked about, that, that all kind of leads to the response, like how many members we're going to have to handle the situation, but how on earth can we possibly know how many people we're going to need, how many police officers are we going to need in order to handle the situation if we're not even in the situation yet? Um, so uh, sometimes you may look and you say, well, why is there three police officers here? He's not dangerous. Uh, sometimes it's because... Uh, Two police officers is actually one police officer if the if one of the police officers is a trainee um, they're not counted as a police officer until they're fully uh, trained that could be a reason uh, another reason is just the risk assessment of that police officer who was asked to go to that file the risk assessment has dictated that they want to have two more police officers with them that, that just may be that may be the case it doesn't mean that they're coming to fight it just means that their risk assessment of the situation with the information that they had um, dictated they're going to bring to. And let's, let's uh, also remember that as uh, peers or loved ones of somebody that may be in crisis, you may have years of collateral, years of background, years of knowledge of who this person is. We may not have any, except the few minutes of, of information that we're getting from whoever's calling in and maybe some background information that we have on a database. Um, but meanwhile, we're still driving to the file. So we don't have the luxury of stopping, pulling over and reading a bunch of things and trying to do an assessment. If somebody is in crisis in the community, we want to get there and help. Um, this is a big factor for, for a lot of people on the call because you, you guys are watching this. Uh, I'm hoping in order to learn how to advocate for your loved ones and your, your support people that you, you, uh, you support is how cooperative the person was on the phone with us. Um, and I say that because uh, we have we have where people just start yelling at us and say, stop asking all these questions and get here and then they hang up. Well, we're asking the questions because we're trying to paint a picture. And if we don't have that picture, then it's going to be difficult for us to come with the right resources and with the right ta tactics. So uh, you may, if you were cooperative with them on the phone, you may say, uh, my son reacts badly to lights and sirens. So if you can come quieter, that would be far better. Um, my son reacts poorly to females or males or tiny little police officers or something that may dictate how we send or who we send to the scene. And then obviously, what are the needs and the expectations of the person calling? Uh, if we're on the phone and they say, you know, we, we desperately need our son to go to the hospital, um, that is a, con a police consideration. We know what you're looking for. We know what you want. Um, but as I said earlier, we have to jump through some hoops before we can, we can make that happen. So how are the police officers trained? Uh, our police officers get six months of immersive training in Regina. So I like to say, think boot camp. We've all seen the movies. That's exactly what it is. It's marching on the parade square. It's polishing your boots. It's uh, learning to use police defensive tactics. It's learning to drive. It's learning the law. Um, and we spend a lot of time problem solving. Like when we learn the law and we learn, even when we're learning police defensive tactics, we use a model called CAPRA. And it's a, a model about our community, bringing in community people, uh, acquiring information, who are our partners, what are the requirements, um, and that sort of thing. And so even, even in our police defensive tactics or driving, uh, driving skills, we're always asking that community stuff. We, we are, a lot of our training is, is community based and working with the community and being a part of a solution as opposed to um, uh, dictating the solution. And there's times when we as police officers have to dictate a solution. So we walk into a 
challenging situation uh, and we have to take charge of a situation and that that's the reality but we we generally try to work with uh, work with the community as much as we possibly can um, once you get out of uh, Regina you are sent to your first detachment I was sent to Surrey uh, and then you are given a, uh, a, a, a trainer so somebody with so a lot more experience um, who essentially rides shoulder to shoulder with you for six months of on-the-job training. Uh, so usually for the first three to four months, uh, they are actually sitting beside you in a police car. And then for the next three to, you know, two to three months afterwards, they'll monitor your work. They'll, you're there to, you can ask them questions. They listen to you on the radio. They go to files with you and watch how you handle situations. And that sort of thing. So it's uh, six months of, of boot camp training, six months on the job training, um, and I've already talked to that. It, it incorporates uh, and encompasses community issues um, and getting buy-in from stakeholders. That's a ton of our training is around that. Um, we have uh, a cr critical incident de-escalation training, uh, and it has a huge, um, like a real strong mental health component to it now. And so it's a, it's a online training course, it takes about four hours to do it. Um, and we have to do it annually and we have to recertify with it annually. Uh, I know that doesn't sound like a lot. I know that in a, in a perfect world, we would get, you know, a week of uh, critical incident de-escalation training um, with a strong mental health component every year. That would be spectacular. We get four hours of, of, uh, of training. I'll put it in perspective though. Um, I have to, uh, I have to um, recertify with my firearm every year uh, and I can do that in about 20 minutes. Uh, so the training for, the, for, for firearm use is about 20 minutes every year and um, the critical incident de-escalation is about a four hour thing every year. So uh, it's better than some of our other training. Um, and there's obviously ongoing skills uh, throughout the police officer's career. Every three years, we have to go uh, to a training facility called the Pacific Regional Training uh, Center in Chilliwack. Um, and we do uh, training for our um, OC spray, which is our, our bear spray, our baton, handcuffing. Um, uh, and then there's a huge, that, so that takes about a half a day. And the rest of the week is all, um, uh, de-escalation stuff, uh, uh, scenario-based training where you're talking to people, you're engaging with people. Some people are in uh, mental health crises, some people are criminals, some people come at you armed and you have to deal with that. Uh, and it's all, all uh, skills training, but that's, uh, that's one week every three years. Um, you know, I've already spoken about the mandatory annual training and then there's specialized training if you go into different sections. And so a different section would be, say, the economic crime section, um, or if you went into forensics, uh, forensics is, uh, is a big uh, a training piece around that. If you go to the, dogs, the dog squad, that's a different section there. Um, emergency response team, specialized training stuff. Yeah, so uh, what should you do, or when should you call the police, right? So. Um, you want to call the police when your loved one is in crisis or an immediate risk to themselves or others. Um, and you are not uh, in a position to take care of that. Um, or, uh, and ideally, uh, you've already established a relationship with myself, Patty and Kelly. Um, and you're calling us to say, hey, um, I'd like to update. We, I'll give an example. It's easy when I give examples. I like telling stories. Uh, we have a, a mom in the community and she has a child who has um, uh, some very, very challenging issues and he can be quite violent when he acts out. Uh, he's, he was 10 when we first uh, got introduced to him. And as he's growing and aging, uh, she keeps calling us every six months with an update of how tall he is and how heavy he is and that sort of thing. So um, that would be another example of when you can call us and you call us when you're not in crisis. I, although again, it's not a great thing to have to call us to update what your child looks like because you may need to call the police. Um, yeah, that's when you should really call the police. If you have to, I always like to say to people, if you're asking the question, should I call the police? Call the police. Call us. Doesn't mean we're going to drop everything and come running to your house. Um, sometimes it just is a back and forth between you and the call taker to better get a better understanding of what you could be doing or should be doing. 
Um, but, you know, uh, I don't know how many of the viewers um, uh, tonight are in North Van, but oh, we're not that busy in North Van. Uh, so we have some times and we love getting out and meeting people. And we would much rather meet people when things are going okay than when things are completely off the rails. Okay, so uh, how to advocate for your loved one um, and, and partner with the police. So this is when you're on the phone with us and you're talking to our call taker. Um, try to separate yourself from the loved one. I know that's easy to say, it's harder to do sometimes. I get that, I, I do, I understand that. But in an ideal situation, if you can remove yourself from the situation completely, then you have a clearer mind and you can actually answer our questions and be calm with us when you're doing that. Um, stay calm and answer all the questions. I know it can be really frustrating when we keep asking a bunch of questions and you're thinking to yourself, can you please just hurry up and get here? Uh, don't worry, we're probably on our way already, especially if someone is in crisis and it's happening right now. Uh, we mobilize immediately upon call. So when there's a call, you call the call takers in, uh, in the North Vancouver detachment, it gets uh, sent over to the dispatcher and the dispatcher is dispatching the file while you're still on the call. So you're still on the call feeding information to the, disp to the call taker. The call taker then types it. It shows up on the dispatcher's uh, screen and then the dispatcher goes over the radio and provides more information as it's coming in as the police officers are on the way. So just take a nice deep breath, try to be calm with us and answer the questions that are posed to you no matter how ridiculous they may sound to you, we are probably already on our way. Um, try to stay on the, on the phone with us as long as possible. Um, it's always best that the call taker says, okay, you can hang up now because the call taker's got all the information they need. Um, but sometimes we want them to call back because sometimes I, I may have a question and the call taker didn't ask that question. So I may, you may have to call back. So ideally just stay on the phone with us as long as you possibly can. Um, yeah, I don't know how to tell us to say this, but the police are here to partner with you. We want to partner with you and provide uh, the care to your loved one or the person that you're advocating for. Um, we want you to be a part of the solution. Um, we need you to be a part of that solution. We need you to be there with us and advocate for your loved one or the person that you're supporting. Um, uh, try not to fear having to call the police. I know, I know it's, I know it can be quite traumatizing. The big, the big machine is rolling up when you call and you know, we all come out with our, with our body armor on and our weapons on and everything else. I get all that, but those are, just the, those are just the tools that you can see. The tools you can't see necessarily until they're in action are all the training for the de-escalation that we get, the talking to people, the trying to be calm with people. Um, and the fact that for the most part, uh, we've all joined uh, a profession because at some level we want to help. We want to help and we want to, we want to be a part of a solution for, um, for the people uh, that we're dealing with. So try to empower us with knowledge. If, if, it, if it helps, if you have the opportunity, meet us down on the driveway, come out to the driveway and meet us when the police are rolling up and have a quiet conversation with them. Let them know what's happening. Let them know what your ask is. Let them know what, how best to work with your, your, uh, your loved one or the person that's in crisis that you're supporting. Um, you know, uh, sometimes you do everything right, but you still have to call the police and that's okay, right? Uh, we're, we're here to assist you. We want to be a part of that. Um, so I've already kind of covered a lot of this stuff. We do our research before uh, getting there, but a lot of times that's done while we're still driving our cars, depending on how, um, uh, you know, the, the crisis that's happening. Um, uh, you know, uh, we, we run what's called a risk assessment. We're constantly doing a risk assessment. It's ongoing, flexible, and ever-changing, and we always have to be able to be adaptable to that. Uh, so, um, and I've touched on this sometimes more is, is less and, I, and again if I walk into a situation and it's me against somebody that's six foot and 200 pounds and the fight is on somebody's going to get injured um, but if I walk in with two other of my mates uh, and we can just hold the person down until the energy has ex been expended and they start calming down there's a less likelihood that somebody's going to get going to get injured um, you yeah, know police officers always want a peaceful resolution um, you know 
we're equipped for all eventualities. I always like to say that police officers are generalists and we don't have the opportunity, we don't have the ability to just hang up certain tools uh, and, and you know, leave them in the trunk of the car uh, when we're walking into a situation. We have to carry all of our tools with us at all times. Uh, we're generalists. Um, and uh, even, even in my line of work, what I do, I spend a lot of time in the office, you know, typing documents and that sort of thing. Um, but when I go down the road, I'm, I am fully equipped. I have all of my use of force options and I am prepared to walk into some of the worst situations that are imaginable, not to do with mental health, only because I'm a police officer in the road. And if I have to walk into a heaven forbid, an active shooter situation, um, I need to be equipped. I need to be ready. Uh, and so all police officers will show up with all of their tools. Um, but we always like to say that, that one of the best tools is, is our mouth and our brains and how we use those two things. Uh, and then, you know, once we're in the house and we're having a conversation with the person that we're there to see, the, the person that's in crisis, uh, then we will make a, a, a decision based on our observations and the collateral provided by the, by the loved one. So again, uh, let's say you were a, a, a peer support for a friend and you can say to us, look, I've known this person for the last three years. I've never seen them like this before. Uh, they've been decompensating over the last six months. Um, they're not returning my calls. I came over to check on them and so on and so on. All of that stuff is really good information. And that, that information is what we're going to use to make a decision on whether or not we're going to take them to the hospital. Um, now, uh, if we show up and the person that's in, uh, quote unquote, in crisis or is in need of help, uh, if they say, well, I want to go to the hospital, but, uh, and so they're willing to go, um, but if they weren't willing to go, I would have apprehended them, then even though they're willing to go, I must stay with them. And I'll say that again. If I walk in and think, oh dear, this person, I will have to apprehend this person, but the person says, I am willing to go, I want to go to the hospital, I would say that is excellent, but I will still be there with them to present them to a doctor. Because if I don't, and then they were to leave the hospital and then go missing or get hurt somewhere, there would be an inquest and the question would be, why did you not go with them? Did you think they needed to go to a hospital? If I said, yes, I think they need to go to the hospital, I didn't stay with them then it would be on me as a liability issue. So that's why uh, even if somebody says they wanna to go to the hospital, if we believe that that's a really good move and they really should go to the hospital, we will still go with them. I call it like a, I call it a soft apprehension, meaning um, I would just be with them and make sure that we get them to a hospital and, and, and make sure that they follow through with their commitment to see a doctor. Uh, and then if we decide that we don't need to take them right away, let's say they've calmed down because the uniform showed up or they've calmed down because of the work that you as, as the loved ones have been able to do with them and they're calm and everything's cooled down then. And we feel comfortable that there's been a game plan set up and that the person is maybe they've taken their meds and they're going to be falling asleep in a half an hour and you assure us that everything is fine. Um, then we don't take them to the hospital. But then usually what happens is they'll give a referral to us uh, my team, and then my team will will look into them, as I said, several slides back, and we'll try to make a determination on whether or not they're connected to services. I've been telling a lot of stories. How good are we on time here? So we've been at it for almost an hour. Um, so I'll summarize here, uh, Emma, and then I think we can turn to questions because we want to make sure that the people that are here have a voice. Um, like I've said in my presentation, we want you to have a voice when you're advocating for your loved one, when you have to call the, the police or the police are arriving when you call the ambulance. We want you to tell the story. We need you to tell the story. We need you to advocate for your loved ones. So I wanna make sure you have the voice here as well. Um, uh, you know, the, we're your partners. Uh, we're, we're partners with the healthcare providers. And again, we talk about that circle of care piece. Um, call the police when you've, when you've tried everything else or the person poses an imminent risk to themselves or others, you really need help and, and call the police will come and help you. Um, part of my introduction at the back there, you probably like some people may be wondering, well, I don't really care. You know, you like to make, you know, home, home renovation projects or you got a couple of kids or whatever, that's all fine. And any, the, the point is uh, we're just people, right? We're all just people like you. We all have wants and desires in life. We all, we all uh, breathe the same air, we eat the same food. Um, uh, we just do a job. And ultimately, uh, ultimately as police officers, we want a peaceful, res uh, peaceful resolution. 
especially when dealing with people in a, in, in a, in a mental health crisis, they're not considered criminals. Uh, so we would rather not go hands-on with, with someone that's not considered a criminal. We're all for it when we're chasing bad guys. Don't get me wrong. We love going hands-on with bad guys. Um, but uh, when we're dealing with people that are in crisis, it's, uh, we'd rather do it using our, our, uh, our words and our brains. Uh, you know, answer the questions and cooperate with the call taker and the police officers as, as silly as some of the questions may sound to you and you, you may be feeling that anxiety and you're, you're kind of stressed out of what's happening. You can't believe they're asking these silly questions. We're asking the questions for a reason. We may not have the time to tell you why, but we need to know the answers to try to stay calm with us. And then like, you know, just stay, just try to say hi to us on the street. Cause again, we're people and we like to say hi to people. That's it, that's my presentation. Thank you, Neil. Thank you very much for that time, all your time. And um, right, we have lots of questions that have come in. So I'm just kind of pulling them all together. Awesome. So